We are Green Hill School. This is our environmental film about What is marine pollution and why is it bad? Uh, basically, marine pollution is anything that's entering the marine environment that has an ill or harmful effect to the inhabitants or um, the water. And it can be physical, such as litter, or chemical, like um, PCBs and heavy metals. And you can even have sound pollution, which can be like sonar from big ships and the Navy and things like that. What are the chemicals that come out of factories into the sea? The chemicals are different, there'll be PCBs, which are the um, effects of the plastics that are produced in factories, and there are also heavy metals, and the metals can be very bad for people, they can stop organ function, and the PCBs um, are really bad for reproduction, and also they attack the immune systems. PCBs. What are PCBs? PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls, and they're the, the offsets of the plastic industry, so there'll be things like electrical goods and different things like fire retardants, all these different chemicals that are being released into the atmosphere. So if they're put in landfill sites, as they begin to degrade, they then go through the soil, into the river systems, into the water systems, and they, they just really attack different marine mammals. On what scale does contamination in prey affect cetaceans? It affects them a lot because things like the shellfish and the little fish, they all take on these PCBs, but then as the dolphins and things then eat them, they take on all those PCBs into themselves, and so the predators that are higher up the food chain take on board more and more and more, and with dolphins, the males can't offload these PCBs, they just stay with them. With the females, they can offload them onto their calves, so they're stored in their blubber so that when they're then feeding their, their young, all of that fat from their blubber goes into their milk and goes straight into the calf. So you'll find that with the first calves that are born, they tend to die because they're just burdened with all these PCBs. OK, guys, um, we found lots and lots of the common shore crab, but we've also now found a couple of these guys, OK? And these guys are sometimes referred to as the brown crab, but most often they're referred to as the edible crab. Now, we could eat all the crabs, but these are the ones that we tend to eat in this country. So, I don't know how many of you eat crab. Do you, do you like the taste of crab? Yeah? And if you go to Tesco's or any other supermarket like that, you're going to see these carapaces. So, this shell here, you'll find these turned upside down with all the meat of the crab inside it. So, you might recognize this as the edible crab. That's a really great example of how all these pollutants that perhaps are being eaten by worms and being eaten by these tiny barnacles, you might think, well, how can they affect me? <laughs> well. The barnacles are ingesting tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of pollutants. The crabs are going around and eating lots and lots and lots of barnacles and lots of worms and lots of dead fish. And they're building up and building up and building up all these different um, chemicals and pollutants within their bodies. And when one of these crabs gets to about this size, we might find ourselves eating one in a restaurant and paying a lot of money for it. Very tasty. But we're also then ingesting all of the pollutants that this crab has eaten over its lifetime. Some of the crabs that we get that are sort of this sort of size could be 20, 30, maybe 40 years old. So that's an awful lot of bioaccumulation, an awful lot of these pollutants that have been accumulating in its body over and over and over all that period of time. We're going to feed a mussel to an anemone now. They're taking it in actually quite quickly. They're wrapping their little sticky tentacles around it and just like sucking it in. If the mussels had toxins in or, um, and then the anemone took all, 
say about I don't know five mussels in and they all had quite a lot of toxins in then the, the anemone would die well the next stage is that the fish might eat the anemone and then it's all about the food chain really because the, f the fish get eaten by the cetaceans then and if the cetaceans eat all these fish that are con contaminated by these toxins then in the end the cetaceans will be contaminated too. about the Sea Empress or the Gulf disaster? Yeah, the, um, the Sea Empress disaster happened down in, in the south of here, so in Pembrokeshire. And it was in 1996 and there was a, an oil tanker that was coming back from the North Sea. And as it was coming in to dock at um, Pembrokeshire, then it hit some rocks and I think it was 73,000 um, tonnes of oil was spilled into the sea which obviously is going to have a massive impact on the environment. I mean, the sand was just absolutely saturated in this oil. And so if the sea floor is going to be saturated in this oil, it means that all the organisms can't then feed, which means that the higher predators, such as dolphins and things like that, wouldn't then be able to feed. So can you tell me anything about the Gulf disaster? Yeah, well, as you know, there's been this massive oil leak in the Gulf. Um, at the moment, scientists are still doing research to try and find out what effect it's had. But I know that one thing they found out is about 80 dolphins have been stranded and that's about 10 times higher than the normal amount of strandings there are. So it could be related, it could not be. They're trying to find out at the moment. Is there much litter on the beaches in South Wales and Cardigan Bay? We have seen a, a, a lot of litter, especially over the summertime when there's more people. And um, I think if there's not enough bins or they've sort of gone down the beach and been out picnicking or whatever, then often, yeah, we have, um, we've done walks and um, had bag loads of um, litter. One of the other girls has brought bag loads of litter back from the beaches. So it's quite sad to see, but yeah, it, um, it does happen. Yeah. So do you know why people throw litter in the sea? I think people just think of the sea as being like a large dustbin and they don't think of the consequences. They think nothing lives there and they just throw it in there. But even if the rubbish that's thrown in doesn't end up on this beach, it'll end up on some other beach. In the um, Pacific, there's a massive island that's just rubbish where all the currents have come from all over the world and just stay in one place and there's just a massive amount of rubbish floating in the Pacific. Oh, dog poo. <laughs> Who found that? Me. Hugh, what do you think of dog poo on the beach in a bag? I nearly stepped. <laughs> <laughs> Is that any good to leave dog poo in a bag? Not really. Why is that? It's better to leave your dog poo on the beach than put it in a bag and leave the bag there. If the bag gets washed out to sea, it could take years to biodegrade. Hello, today we're here with the Darwin Centre at Manabia Beach doing a litter pick. We've only been here an hour and we've found lots and lots of litter. This is just an example of what we've found. This is really, really bad as it can entangle cetaceans or if a fish got tangled in it, a cetacean might think it was food and eat it. This is bad because it can easily kill cetaceans or harm marine animals. Ella, what is that that you've got in your hand? What, I mean, what exactly is it? It's a fish line that has tangled with a kelp. It's also got a hook in it, which could be harmful to animals. There are lots of different um, creatures that can be affected by these, this sort of litter. Uh, in the first instance, if we look at the oil, for instance, you can see that it's, it's dripping uh, some of its contents and it's very sticky and oily. If that was in a rock pool, that would, that, would, that would pollute the rock pool very quickly, okay, and that would poison it. I mean, it would be toxic, so that would actually poison the creatures that are in there, so that's, that's pretty serious stuff. Um, you've got other things, like for instance, this long tassel, which is off a, off a balloon. If that was floating in the sea, it might look like a jellyfish, so a creature might eat it. It might get stuck in its windpipe. 
it's a, if it's a, if it's a mammal, or it might get um, wedged in its stomach, uh, and that could cause problems like infections. Um, netting and fishing gear like this is a problem too. I mean, its, its whole purpose is to catch things and tangle things up. And you can see it's doing a very good job there. If there was perhaps a small fish in there that was rotting away and smelling quite tasty to some creatures, a creature might come down and try and eat from within within this tangled uh, mess, like a bird or perhaps a, a, a young seal or something like that, and could get themselves stuck inside there as well. A, a big problem with, particularly with netting, is that it, it kind of floats around the sea for years and years and years afterwards, and they call it ghost fishing. So it'll carry on fishing. So a piece of net this big will perhaps catch a fish in it, and over a few months that fish will rot away, and then the net will carry on going. But that net, I mean, plastic like this might last for hundreds of years in the environment. So this, this little tanglement here could be killing creatures for hundreds and hundreds of years. We find um, with litter, a lot of the beaked whales are affected because they, they tend to swallow it thinking it's food, and turtles too. I know they're not mammals, but they're very affected by litter. Um, so um, it means that they can't eat properly because they've swallowed like the plastic bags or bottles and things like that. Do they beach because of this? Yes, they can do. Um, often they can beach if they're like if they were to have um, consumed some of the plastics. If they um, are unable to eat and they start to starve, they can beach themselves because they're exhausted. Also, too, if they're um, suffering from like chemical pollutants, they can beach themselves too because they their immune system's down. They um, might not be eating very much, um, so they get they tire themselves out. This is a plastic bottle, which someone's probably dumped after they've finished it. Um, this could easily wash up into the sea and animals could mistake it for a jellyfish or their food or something because it's shiny and birds are attracted to stuff like that. Um, and then there's a plastic bin here, which was probably thrown out from a shop or a cafe or something. And they just thought they'd throw it on the sea. And obviously there's sharp edges that animals could hit themselves on. And then there's stuff like this that animals could easily get their heads stuck in. What is that then? This looks like, I'm not quite sure actually, but it's rubbery. It could be anything. Um, I'm not sure. But any animal could um, get stuck in this. And then there's stuff like this, which has been washed up from old boats that people have just thrown overboard. And any animal could eat that really, thinking that it's their food. It could look like seaweed. I mean, there's lots of stuff here. All of it's very dangerous to marine wildlife. And they all hurt themselves on it. So it's kind of good that we've come down here and collected as much as we can, which will hopefully help. Imagine it was July now and it's a school holiday. Which mm, animals? Which, yeah, humans, exactly, yeah. Don't forget we're animals as well, aren't we? <laughs> OK, and we live on the coast and, and we use the sea, so yeah, that would... That would hurt any animal that stood on it, but particularly humans. You can imagine playing football on the beach, running over that. Mm. Hi Luke, could you tell me about this lobster pot? Uh, yes, I could. We found this lobster pot over there on the rocks, which must have been brought in by the tide. This was probably brought in in stormy weather, because the stormy weather causes these lobster pots to break free of their moorings and get washed ashore. Now, if we hadn't taken this over here, the tide would have probably taken it back out to sea and any lobsters or anything could have got caught in here and any then if they rot and die then any birds or larger fish could come and get stuck and that would how it would work everything gets caught up in here can you see because I can't pull this out it's too hard and there's all this netting and stuff which could easily catch fish and birds this wire here so quite dangerous and these rusty bits of metal here anyone who didn't see this could walk up and stab themselves easily or it could happen to birds and fish who weren't aware so it's basically a death trap for animals so pally what have you been doing today firstly we did some litter picking down at the beach and then we did some rock pooling i really enjoyed it i learned about lots of different um things to do with the rock pooling like the pcbs and the food chains and what different litter is on the beach were you surprised by what litter you found? Yeah, I didn't think we'd find as much as we did as well. Like, and some of the things that we found, like the um, li like and the amount of cotton buds we found as well, surprised me. So, what have you learned today? Um, I've learned about several different sea creatures that are in the rock pools, 
and um, seeing enemies, crabs, and uh, I've also learnt that some beaches that look clean can ha also have a lot of litter, like in, in amongst seaweed. And here we have the magnificent coastline of Cardigan Bay. Beautiful, isn't it? Now imagine if this was like some beaches, with rubbish all over the place, an oil slick in the sea. Wouldn't be very nice, would it? Are there any pollution problems in Cardigan Bay? I think in Aberystwyth, which is just north of us, we um, there's some old mines there and there was a lot of um, leaching of lead into the water there and a lot of a few porpoises um, were killed as a result of the um, toxins. Even though generally Cardigan Bay is a very pollution-free zone, there are certain hotspots where there'll be high levels of PCBs and um, heavy metals in the water and we think that some of them are carried up through sort of Cardiff and the Bristol Channel. So it might not necessarily be from this area, but with the surface currents moving upwards, they bring them into the area. Here we are in Newquay. We're on a boat to see the bottlenose dolphins and we've seen some seals over there. Now we're going to work with one of the volunteers from the Sea Watch Foundation who are doing a survey on bottlenose dolphins. Can you tell me what you're doing? Yep, um, what I'm doing is recording effort. So um, basically we just we mark on the GPS and get our GPS location. I just record what time, um, the latitude and longitude and then I take a look around the boat. Um, fishing boats. How often do you need to do these surveys? We go out on one of these ermoles every day and then we record effort every few minutes to, um, to keep updated with what's going on, um, yeah, what animals we have. And they are a protected species in the UK where we do have a code of conduct to adhere to. We were not allowed to go chase the dolphins. We do have to give them a certain amount of distance. And also we have a time limit to stay in their presence. Who are the Sea Watch Foundation and what do they do? Um, well, they're a national-based um, charity, foundation. And basically their aim is, to con is for con conservation and protection of whale and dolphin and porpoise species in um, Britain and Irish waters. And so our head office is here in Newquay and basically we are, are monitoring and researching the bottlenose dolphin and harbour porpoise populations in Cardigan Bay. So um, we do land watches and boat surveys and, just, um, and we do lots of photo ID to try and get an idea of population size and where they go and what they do. Can you tell me about the dolphins in Cardigan Bay? Um, yes, we've got a few favourites that hang around that we know um, and we've just had a few um, mothers have their newborns which we saw on survey the other day and they're really cute and they're a um, semi-resident population so it means that they like to hang out here in the summertime when it's nice and warm and then they usually head up north and follow the food up north and so they'll hang around up north in the winter and then come back down in summer again. Have any of the Cardigan Bay dolphins let, had calves this year? Yeah, they have. There's been at least three that um, we've identified and can name. So we've had Nick Nick, uh, we've had Money Penny, and she had a calf, so it's now been named Tuppence. And recently we've seen that Chris has a calf, and this is quite exciting because Chris would always be babysitting other calves. And so we'd be thinking, has Chris had a calf or not? And then the other day we finally saw Chris with a newborn, and it was so young you could see its fetal folds where it had been sort of crammed in the, in the womb. So that was very exciting. Yeah. What can be done to help stop marine pollution and its effects upon marine wildlife? Well, there's lots that can be done. I mean, on a grand scale, on a big scale, you need factories and these people that manufacture all these goods. They need to be careful with what they do with their waste. They need to think about these things properly and not even just what they do with their waste, but they need to stop the waste in the first place. So all the big companies just really need to consider what they're doing. But then on a small scale, things like we can do, when you go shopping, don't use plastic bags, try and take your own bags um, and just try and buy from companies that are really eco-friendly. So if you have a choice, then try and opt for the one that are doing their best for the environment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.